I don't know where Steve is coming from. I don't, I don't know if this is a, some swan song that he has as he's about to go off into the sunset, but we are sick and tired of people who don't live here, who, who don't even govern us, trying to tell us what to do and how to do it. takeover of the city police board. St. Charles County Executive Steve Ellman joins us on the record to make his case. And Illinois Senator Tammy Duckworth faces her first bid for re-election. She joins us on the record in her campaign against Republican trial attorney Kathy Salvi. Plus, I don't know when science professor Anita Mannion gives us her expert analysis for the record. It's all coming up on the record. Thank you for joining us this week. I'm Mark Maxwell. St. Louis Mayor Tashara Jones is now pushing back against new calls in an op-ed from uh, for state lawmakers to rein in the city's quote sky high crime rates the author of that article steve ellman claims crime in the city hampers growth in the region but his calls go beyond just revisiting local control uh, of the police board in favor of a state takeover he also argues that the city of st louis wrongly has total control over the region's most important asset the lambert airport he's calling on the state legislature to step in and solve some of st louis's biggest problems He's also the leader of the second largest local government in our region, in the state, Steve Ellman uh, from St. Charles County. Thanks for joining us on the record. Glad to be here, Mark. Aren't you overstepping your boundaries here? No, uh, not at all. I, uh, and I disagree with one thing you said. The, this particular article, uh, 25 years ago, I was a uh, leader in the Missouri Senate uh, of an effort, uh, bipartisan effort, by people, senators in the region to, to, to create a, re a regional airport authority. This particular uh, op-ed piece does not talk about control of the airport. What I'm suggesting is that all the leaders in the region need to get together and we need to go as a group to Washington, D.C. and try to get the money the airport's going to need to bring it up to the standards that, uh, that, we, that we deserve. Because we have those quotes from the opening paragraph of your article where you, you put crime right next to the control of the airport. What does no. one have to do with the other? Nothing. But both have to do with the future of the region. So what's the benefit in, so right now St. Louis, the city, mm -hmm. controls the airport. It sounds like you want to change that. Well, again, yeah, I think it would be ideal, but what I say in the, in the article, if you, if you want to uh, read it, it's in the very last paragraph. It says, if we work together to improve that airport, maybe the city then will realize it's in their best interest to involve the entire region in that airport. You know, Mark, the, the airport originally, and we need to thank the people in the city of St. Louis in 1927, they made the initial investment. They put their money at risk. It was government obligation bonds to start the airport. But in my lifetime- Those people aren't still voting, are they? No, they're not. And in my lifetime, all the money that has gone into the airport has come from federal uh, sources paid for by all of us in our federal taxes or by user fees. So the city continues to own it, continues to run it, but it's basically the users and the federal taxpayers who are paying for it, and the city will always be first among equals at the airport, but there, I don't see why there can't be a way in which the rest of us can have some input. Why should other governments have their hands in the pot? Can't you, is, isn't there a point at which you have too many cooks in the kitchen? I, I, don't, I don't believe so, and I, I think uh, uh, our airport, was ranked 23rd out of 27 in its uh, in its particular category recently. So you think and the St. Louis County or St. Charles County would be better at would would bring something different? What would be the improvement? Well, for one thing, uh, you wouldn't have to uh, uh, live in the city to work at the airport. Uh, that was one of the arguments we made 25 years ago. But so it's about uh, jobs. Yeah, the big the big uh, it, it's almost a, a taxation without representation. Okay. If, if federal taxpayers, including those in St. Charles County and Franklin and Jefferson and St. Louis County, are contributing to the airport, it just seems logical that they would have some input into how the airport's running. The cities recognize that fact, and we, for the last 12 years, I believe, have had a representative on an advisory board uh, at the airport, but all the big uh, decisions are still made downtown, and they're made in a political subdivision that has uh, 300,000 people and a small percentage of those get to vote and, and elect 
the leaders to make the decision that really is affects the entire region. We started off talking about the airport. I'm going to shift to crime. I'm glad yeah. you mentioned that taxation about repre uh, without representation because your article calls for revisiting local control of the police board, which you just finished saying a moment ago. You were one of the prime advocates for it, switching mm -hmm. it for s from St. Louis uh, uh, where the state controlled the police board to giving the city local control. Right now, Kansas City is the only city in the country where the st uh, that, that does not have control of its own police board. Why go back in the other direction, you know, into the other two centuries ago? Why go back? Uh, look at what's happened in the last five, six years with regard to crime and the number of murders, the, uh, the number of cases that have been filed by the prosecuting attorney. I mean, uh, the fact of the matter is, and, and uh, th the mayor is right about Well, the, the prosecuting attorney, that, that's a separate, we'll, we'll get to that in a okay. minute. But yeah. don't you see that as a separate issue? No, I see, over which I city see controls crime the in police the city board? Uh, overall as a, as, a, as a very important issue. And the, the mayor's quote, which he just had up on the screen just a minute ago, she is right about one thing. This, whatever th I'm doing here, this is a swan song. I've got uh, well, one you're on more the term. I've got one more term. I'm not. I'm unopposed, so I will be elected, and I, and I have four more years to make a difference. I tell the people in St. Charles County, when I address them, I say, "Listen, we are doing very well. We do. We grew 12 percent uh, in the last census. I think we're going to continue to do well for a while, but in the long run, unless the region gets its act together, and the region only grew 1.2 percent." Unless the region gets its act together, eventually everybody who wants to move to St. Charles County will do it, and then all of us will be no growth. And that is something that I hope is a long way down the road, but I think it's something we need to be aware of. And I think the key to the region growing is getting the uh, crime in the city under control because the city is the face of the region. It's what the uh, it, it city has a lot of the things that we're very proud of. Okay, and we love to uh, brag about, but the city also has a problem which reflects on all the rest of the region when we try to bring people in here and convince them this is a good place to build a business, to raise a family, and to, uh, and to have, a, have a, a worthwhile lifestyle. Do you acknowledge the racial component to the history of the state police uh, and the state control of the police department in St. Louis, meaning that the, s the state, as you wrote, was skeptical and had a wary eye of the city back then. It's precisely because the city was abolitionist, anti-slavery, and other people oh, farther inland in rural Missouri were more pro-slavery. Yeah, the city of St. Louis, and in indeed the entire region, that's one th thing this region was together on. We were almost all against uh, slavery, at least the majority of us were. Uh, and it's largely due to the German population in the city, the county, St. St. Charles County, Franklin County. So yeah, uh, ever since the Civil War, there's been, a, there's been a tension there over that particular issue. But there's other issues that have come up in the meantime, uh, just issues involving governance and, and crime and corruption and other things. And the legislature has had to deal with those at various points in our history. And even though the city of St. Louis, and for that matter, city of St. Charles, is much older than the state of Missouri, as a legal entity, they are a political subdivision of the state, and, and the state has some amount of control, which, as you already said, has, has exercised in the past, continues to exercise in Kansas City. Right. Of course, uh, our viewers will know that St. Louis existed before even the state of Missouri mm -hmm. did. Of course, the state still has that preeminence in the, in the subdivisions, as you've uh, titled it there. Uh, but I guess I I'm wondering, though, why go back? Uh, some political operators might view this threat uh, to the mayor. Uh, this power grab, this takeover, as sort of a, a, a bluff, a negotiating position to bring her to the table on something else, or to get her to back down on uh, police oversight. No, I say, I think I say that in the article. The best outcome here, and I, I still believe in local control. I mean, I'm a county executive. I don't, I, and I was in favor of the local control going back to the city. What I hope will happen here, first of all, somebody's got to file a bill, and then you know the process. It takes many years sometimes to, to get something passed. My hope is we get a bill filed, we start a debate, we have a good discussion, but before anything can happen in Jeff City, the mayor, instead of you know, challenging uh, motivation here and attacking the, uh, the messenger, will debate the message and come up with a plan so that they don't have to do anything in Jefferson City to get crime under control. 
Would you, and this would is you support the state taking over control of the police board in St. Charles? If we had the crime rate that the city of St. Louis has, absolutely. Very, you, you would? Yes. Very interesting. Uh, you also, I want to give you one last chance. To, we, you, you talked about a few other things like the highway patrol. The mayor said she was open to that uh, mm -hmm. assistance mm -hmm. on the highways. You also talked about combining the circuit court from the county and the city of St. Louis together. That sounds a little bit more like, a, like you want to fire one of the two prosecutors because you'd still have all the no, same that's, caseload. That's the important, uh, important thing is I don't want to fire. Well, you're the, making the case. The, the, no, the, the voters will select. The voters one already did. The two. Yeah, but they will select one and again. But in, in winnowing the choice from two to one, you're firing one of the positions. You're, you're getting yeah, rid of Yeah, and why are you assuming uh, one? You're, you're, I think you think you know which one will be. Uh, will where be where are more voters in St. Louis County or St. Louis City? I don't you know, know it's three to one, St. Louis County. It'll be about the personalities, it'll be about the performance and the philosophy that the prosecutor brings to the job. Uh, this is not unprecedented either. You mentioned Kansas City with uh, the state appointing the, uh, the members of their police board. Kansas City is in Jackson County, and the city and the county are one circuit. Okay, it, they're one circuit right. with one prosecutor. Now, they have two courthouses, one downtown in Kansas City, one in Independent. We would have the same thing in, in the city and county here. We'd have two courthouses. We'd have... Uh, no judge, uh, bailiff, or janitor would lose their job, but the, the, we'd have half of the people in the region voting to determine who is the prosecutor in what is, without a doubt, the most important jurisdiction in the region. I guess, how do you explain to people who might say, wait a minute, you think the key to making the St. Louis region safer is fewer prosecutors? No, it, the key is to have a, a, an efficient prosecutor's office, and, and I'll let you go ahead and do the, the research on, on the, the number of uh, cases that have been filed, the number of convictions, and so forth. But the uh, important thing here is that, uh, is that uh, again, this is not unprecedented. This is something that's absolutely... Um, and, and, you know, I have some folks that have talked to me and others have suggested what we need to do is, is pass a statute allowing the governor to appoint a special prosecutor, mm -hmm. okay? So if we have a situation where the crime is not getting prosecuted, allow the governor to appoint a special prosecutor. Now, that is a bit perhaps too undemocratic. I still think people should be able to elect their prosecutor. We should have that amount of local control. But I, I think in an area uh, uh, that's this important, having only a small portion of a small uh, jurisdiction uh, make the most important decision is not good policy. All right, very interesting discussion with Steve Elman, <laughs> the uh, county executive of St. Charles County. Before we go, uh, you understand you'd have to get this through the Senate and the House in Jefferson City. Oh, absolutely. You've worked there before, so help us understand how realistic or how heavy a lift would something like this be? You know there's a lot of population in St. Louis, a lot of lawmakers from there, and I can't imagine they'd be uh, licking their chops to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the mayor. Yeah, uh, again, you know, all these ideas uh, that were in my op-ed piece uh, were in a uh, presentation I made to a Senate in the interim committee a year ago. Uh, the mayor and I were the first two to testify uh, at that hearing, and all these ideas were expressed then and, and I kind of thought I'd, I thought so I'd how hear likely is it to pass? How likely? Uh, it's it's going to be a heavy lift. A heavy lift. There you go. Steve Elman, thank you for joining okay. us. Also coming up, Illinois Senator Cammie Duckworth des describes her campaign against Republican Kathy Salvi as the Republican campaigns across Illinois. We talked to her earlier this week in studio. Yeah, we got them some uh, an earmark. Nice. Yeah. A little pork. I don't know. A little bit earmark. Yeah. I think they have a barbecue food truck, too, so maybe yeah. there's pork because of pork. <laughs> Pork squares. Well, I, the I request I get, and I. Yeah, we got them some the money. Um, shape now, in just a few. Balance. In order to win an election. <laughs> All right, we're gonna start here in just a quick second. In three, two, one. Illinois Senator Tammy Duckworth joins us now on the record. Senator, good to have you back with us. With just a few weeks to go before this midterm election, uh, a lot of voters have the economy on their mind. Mm -hmm. Is the economy in better shape now? under President Biden than it was two years ago under President Trump? 
I think it's in a different place. I think that uh, we have some real challenges right now. Inflation is one. You know, I, I talk to working families all the time. Um, I think where we are with gas prices is better now. The gas prices have started coming down, but we have to be very careful that they don't come back up, especially with OPEC and the gas companies deciding that they want to gouge consumers. It's, it's why I introduced an anti-price gouging bill against gas and oil companies. Um, but I do think that we need to continue to make investments in our workers to make sure we get people back to work, get the training that they need, and support our, in our, our manufacturers in particular. You mentioned OPEC. They made a recent announcement dramatically slashing output, which will drive prices higher, no doubt. There was also uh, an incident uh, that disrupted gas lines to Germany between uh, the, the natural gas there. That could also have an upward uh, pressure mm -hmm. on energy prices here in the U.S. at some point. In the U.K., the new prime minister there recently lifted a ban on fracking to inject new uh, domestic energy production there. Should the U.S., should the White House consider that kind of a policy here in the short term as a bridge to get to a cleaner energy future and to stave off higher energy prices? My position is all of the above. What people don't realize is that Illinois is a major energy state. We have fracking. We actually have oil wells. We have more coal miners than Kentucky does. But he's uh, put a freeze have, on, yeah. on leasing federal land, and there, there's some restrictions well, in place that weren't yeah. there before. Should he throw caution to the wind and say, let's go ahead and frack, baby, frack, like Rick Perry <laughs> would say now? Or I say we set a, a date for a carbon neutral future, and then we let the marketplace get us there. Um, as far as the leases are concerned, you should know that the oil and gas companies have 9,000 leases with which they ha already have permits, and they've chosen to stop production. Just like OPEC is choosing to stop production, it's because it's in their best interest to drive up gas prices. In fact, in the, f in the first quarter of this year, the top five oil companies made more money than they have in the previous five years. And, and this, is, this is the problem we have, is that we have people who are not acting. They're, they're countering the market forces, and they're actually forcing prices higher. It's why I've introduced my price gouging bill. Again, going back to your initial question, all of the above. We should be doing clean coal. We should be ca doing carbon capture sequestration. We should be, uh, I don't have a problem against fracking or against uh, drilling for oil, but it all should be part of whatever combination we get, let's get to that carbon neutral date in the future and let the market forces move, fo move us forward. President Obama once referred to Vladimir Putin and Russia as a gas station for the Middle East, as basically had a bunch of clients and, and a lot of their power comes from their ability to create energy. Uh, Vladimir Putin is increasingly cornered you sit on the Armed Services Committee mm -hmm. and you're watching what's happening in Ukraine. How should the U.S. respond if Vladimir Putin does what some of his rhetoric suggests and uses nuclear weapons? Well, if he uses nuclear weapons, um, I think that if he uses any, he'll use a tactical nuclear weapon. Um, but even then, the fallout from that will go to over into Europe, which could trigger Article 5 of NATO, which is the mutual defense treaty. I, I think we need to prevent him from doing uh, just that, using nuclear, uh, any type of nuclear weapon, and we're sending the strongest signals possible. The other thing that we should be doing is what we are already doing, which is supporting the Ukrainians, along with our NATO allies, to help them capture as much territory back as possible, so that it neutralizes Putin's abil ability to project forward. And so if radiation from nuclear fallout reaches into the NATO territory, the U.S. should do what? Well, I think it would be our NATO allies who would trigger. If, if they trigger Article 5, then we would have to adhere to Article 5, which is mutual defense. Which means American forces invading Russia, which means Well, what? I mean, American forces are already in Poland, mm -hmm. um, which would mean that we would be supporting our NATO allies. They're on the front lines of this. I want to shift to some domestic uh, and social uh, issues here in the U.S. You just uh, finished debating Kathy Salvi, the Republican running to challenge you in this race. Uh, she has been vocally in support of... Uh, pro-life positions or anti-abortion positions and uh, w would not exactly answer this national abortion ban question the last time you two debated. Do you think that's an issue that will drive Illinois voters to the polls considering Illinois protects access to abortion? Well, I think that all women should have, ac have access to reproductive choice. I mean, these are questions between you and your doctor. I support uh, codifying Roe v. Wade with the limits within Roe v. Wade, which is uh, viability at 24 weeks. Just Roe v. Wade, we've lived under it for over 50 years. Let's just codify that into law. I think that's what most Americans want. What Kathy wants is a complete ban on abortion, including no exceptions for rape, incest, or for the health of, of the mother. And you can look at the Daily Herald questionnaire that she filled out. She, she's actually on the record saying that she is anti-choice, even to save the life of the mother, even uh, in cases of, of rape or incest. My position, I think, is much more in keeping with where people are. You make these decisions with your with, with your doctor. Um, and I mean, you know, s 
the problem with the Dobbs decision from the Supreme Court is it's about personal autonomy. It's not just about access to abortion. It can affect access to contraception. It can access uh, equal marriage. It can access access to contraception also. And I think that all women, whether they live in Illinois or in Missouri, should have access to, to reproductive choice. You're right that the Supreme Court has considered and debated, deliberated this issue and set that viability standard. Congress actually, uh, former Illinois Congressman Henry Hyde, was instrumental in saying, okay, fine, if you want to have an abortion, but that, that's okay, but some taxpayers might object to funding it. So taxpayer funds, federal funds, could not be used for most abortions. Uh, in 2016, a Brookings study found that, quote, low-income women are five times more likely than affluent women to experience an unplanned pregnancy, but that Hyde Amendment restricts a lot of federal funds from going to fund most abortion services. So how do you balance that right of poor women to have equal access to health care with the taxpayer's individual right to object to how their, their taxpayer dollars are being spent? Well, I think the Hyde Amendment is wrong, and I support um, overturning the Hyde Amendment. I think that if you uh, uh, look at, at the way things are, that it is truly the poorest uh, who are forced into situations where they can't have access to abortions or... Uh, and right now, not even in not even access to IUDs in some cases. There, if you come into Southern Illinois um, and, and you go to uh, 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 some of the Planned Parenthood clinics, you're seeing women coming from as far as Texas just to get IUDs uh, uh, put in because they can't access it themselves. And so, I think that uh, the way forward is to codify Roe v. Wade into law um, and overturn the Hyde Amendment because I think that low-income women should have the same access to reproductive choice as wealthy women. And our last question, I know we're up against the clock here, but in the wake of the Highland Park shooting, you reiterated calls for an assault weapons ban, and I heard you say in your recent debate that you wanted to have a national FOID card. That would affect many of our viewers in Missouri, perhaps, if Missouri was to allow that here, that they've tried to fight some national gun restrictions in the state level in Missouri. But uh, what does that look like, a national FOID card, and how do you define what an assault weapon is? Yep. Well, there are, there are many components to the to the definition of, of what an assault weapons is, and we can we can sort of get into the technicalities of that. Um, but I do think there needs to be an assault weapons ban, along with a high capacity magazine uh, ban as well. Uh, one of the things that law enforcement tells me is the most common denominator in mass shootings across this country, and that's a shooting where three or more people are injured, um, is an assault weapon of some sort, um, and it's the high capacity magazines. I think we need to support our law enforcement with more funding for law enforcement officers. We need to support the officers themselves, but we do need that ban. The national FOID card, you know, I, I, in Illinois we have a national, I have a FOID card, um, and, and you go through a background check uh, to make sure that somebody who has mental health problems, uh, somebody who has a violent felony conviction um, doesn't fall through the cracks and is able to, um, to access weapons when they shouldn't be able to. Uh, until we have a universal background check uh, system, we're not going to be able to support to stop people who should not have weapons from getting them. All right, Senator Tammy Duckworth, we could talk for a lot longer, but we're running out of time. Uh, we've extended the same invitation to Republican Kathy Salvi, who's running against her. You'll see them uh, both on the ballot this November. Senator Duckworth, thanks for joining us. Thank you. And we've been in contact with Kathy Salvi's campaign. We hope to have her here on the record in the weeks to come before the election. Joining us now for instant reaction is our political science professor and expert Anita Mannion. Thank you for joining us again for Good the record. Uh, when you look at Kathy Salvi's challenge, uh, she's never won statewide. Tammy Duckworth has. Tammy Duckworth, a decorated war hero, and you have Kathy Salvi, a trial lawyer who's uh, a bit to the right of maybe the majority opinion of most people in Illinois on the issue of abortion. What's her challenge in competing for votes in, in downstate in the Metro East? Yeah, I think that she's facing an uphill battle against an incumbent who's a Democrat with a huge war chest in Illinois, who, as you said, is a veteran. Um, and the abortion issue right now, it'll be interesting to see how big of a factor that is in Illinois because their rights are protected and enshrined largely in that state. Usually people sort of respond when they feel more under threat. So even though there's this national environment of reproductive rights being under threat in Illinois, how will that resonate? How salient would that be? Uh, yeah. The Duckworth campaign certainly feels that that would be a topic that helps them on the ballot. But it was interesting to hear her interview there. On the issue of abortion, she was clear to say she accepts the restrictions that are present in Roe, meaning she wouldn't go as far as other Democrats have advocated on guns. She was clear to say, I'm a gun owner, and while she wants to ban assault weapons, she's also adopting the rhetoric of police and law enforcement in selling her message. What does that say about her strategy in not wanting to maybe abandon middle ground? 
Yeah, I think that, you know, that's a smart strategy not to maybe go all the way to the far left as we see people going to the right. So maybe if she thinks that Kathy Salvi's gone too far to the right, um, moderating those positions a little might have help her capture the middle of Illinois voters. It's interesting to see that. Even as polls show her with an early lead, she's still fighting out for the uh, middle ground, maybe the independent voter, the swing voter. All right, let's shift back to that conversation more regional we heard a few moments ago between Mayor Kashara Jones in St. Louis and two counties over St. Charles County Executive Steve Ellman. He's pushing uh, for a number of different changes at the state level that would sort of hobble the powers of the mayor. Uh, first of all, handicap the outcome of that. Is he likely to get that through Jeff City, you think, in this political climate? I mean, the state legislature does love to target St. Louis. <laughs> I don't think that, um, you know, that's a, a political risk for many um, legislators across the state to sort of put a bullseye on St. Louis. But I think taking that local control away is a slippery slope. And um, also just getting anything passed in the state legislature is not a fast or easy process. So I wouldn't count on anything happening quickly. Nothing quickly. The, 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 there's also this crime issue that he's using to sort of is the main plank of his broader platform. Right. Um, do you see some urban, rural, sort of regional resentment built into this argument? I think there is, and you know, this isn't just a St. Louis or a Missouri argument. It's an argument that a lot of conservatives are really focusing on crime right now. If you look at ad buys nationally, crime is a huge focus, and so that is a talking point for the 2022 midterms. But certainly crime in St. Louis has been a concern for many years now. Um, but I think that built in this discussion of taking control over St. Louis and the role that St. Charles or the state should have over it, there's lots of implications of rural urban tensions, of racial tensions, um, a lot of other issues built up in there. What do you think of his interview when, when he made his case uh, and you heard his, f for example, consolidating the courts from St. Louis City and County? Uh, was he singling out Tim Gardner there? <laughs> it certainly seems like that, right? That there's. Um, two prosecuting attorneys and a much larger voting base in St. Louis County and certainly a lot of vitriol towards Kim Garner. So it seems inevitable that that would be the outcome that would be sought. Very interesting. He is on the ballot again this year. Steve Elman is, of course, uh, he was uh, essentially unopposed in the primary uh, and expects to win another four-year term in that office. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to know what you're looking for in our interviews coming up next week. Uh, we have Mark Manavani, who's running for the St. Charles, uh, forgive me, for the St. Uh, Lewis, Lewis County. County. I'm getting all uh, the counties <laughs> mixed up here. Mark Manavani running against Sam Page and St. Louis County as executive and Jack Coder. Uh, there's a preview. He's running for the St. Louis Board of Aldermen president position against Megan Green. He's more center right to the center. She's more progressive left. Uh, what are you looking to hear from these two guests next week? Yeah, I, I think they both um, target themselves as more centrist candidate, one moving from a Democrat to a Republican and the other um, positioning himself right of um, Megan Green. So I'm interested to hear why they are positioning themselves the way they are and what they would bring that's different than their challengers. So, you know, I, I suspect that Montevanti is going to come from a business perspective and talk a lot about that, but what would he do differently than Sam Page? And what does he think that his edge in this race is? Why did he move from a Democrat to a Republican other than an opportunity? So I'm interested to hear what both of them have to say next week. Perhaps trying to win at all costs. Yeah. Anita Mannion, thank you for joining us for the record. We'll be back here at the same time next week. Thank you for joining us. Until then, we're off the record.